we can start but uh, you are talking about that panda sir na uh, yeah uh, meanwhile i just a minute uh, be there i'm trying to connect him yeah koshish has already discussed with him actually right now he is in a different meeting okay he told me that i will i know him and i will call him personally and and okay. meanwhile you just share with the recording of that session um, already passed the information yeah yes sir we are going to yeah bandita ma'am Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. <clears throat> to the keynote session of ICNG IOT 2022, organized by Department of Computer Science and Engineering, School of Engineering and Technology, GIT University, Gunnapur. It's my honor and privilege to introduce the first keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Kausik Paul. Professor, Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, IIT Roorkee. Dr. Paul is working as a faculty member of the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, IIT Roorkee, since 2012. He had started his career as a BE in Mechanical Engineering in 2003 from GIET Gunnapur, Odisha. He has obtained his PhD degree in 2009 from IIT Kharagpur. After that, he joined to Jiangsan National University, South Korea, for pursuing his postdoc research. Prior to joining IIT Roorkee, he was a faculty member in NIT Agatala during 2011 to 2012. His field of interest are nanomaterials and other high-performance advanced materials. Dr. Paul has authored about 120 publications till date. Also, he has authored two books, namely Recent Advance in Elastomeric Nanocomposites and Recent Advancement in Processing of Wood Plastic Composite Foam. Dr. Paul has guided 14 PhD scholars and 11 PhD scholars ongoing under his esteemed supervision. He is handling about seven numbers of sponsored research projects, including some international collaborative project and filed five patents. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Paul for his keynote talk. Dr. Paul, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introductions and of course, giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work in front of this August gathering. And of course, I am really, really privileged and the name of this university is something different to me because that's why uh, probably if i remember correctly so this is my fourth lecture basically in this university because i have started my career on in basically in engineering from this particular university and i passed out in the year of 2002 and uh, i was the second batch in this particular university so today uh, conference uh, topic is really really a very pertinent one because it is internet things so of course nowadays everywhere we are relating with that particular topic in our day-to-day -day life and even if the mhrd the our honorable prime minister so everybody is now giving the pressure or maybe are talking about that ai and ml and nowadays also so many institutes they are adapting this ai and ml course in everywhere so in our institute also we have adapted we have invented uh, some new courses over there we have opened some new departments on the ai and ml and not only that uh, from the sponsoring point of view also 
So whatever the nowadays new calls are coming, either in terms of the DST, CSIR, whatever the things. So they are trying to adapt uh, or maybe asking some kind of mixing of that AI and ML or maybe the internet things with the particular technology. Though I am already, uh, you uh, knew it, that I am basically the mechanical engineer. So I have um, working on basically on the different types of materials. So basically we are working on nanomaterials for the various applications. And in between of those, the main applications are basically we are working on the targeted drug delivery basically for the cancer. We are working on the breast cancer and lung cancer. Uh, we are working on some orthopedic implants, mechanical orthopedic implants generally for the knee joint and the hip joint. And uh, earlier we are working also some gas sensors, basically the toxic gas sensors we are working. And uh, <clears throat> later, previously we have done certain kind of work on the air energy storage and harvesting systems. So basically we have worked on some nano generators and we have worked on supercapacitor also. And now also we are working on the supercapacitors. So basically in my lab, what we are doing is that we are synthesizing different types of materials. And not only that, we are basically engineering those kind of nanomaterials and we are working on it. But I don't think that today I'm going to discuss about anything of the nanomaterials because today that is not basically is not related with this topic of these materials. So I am going to discuss about certain things, uh, which is basically that how our internet or maybe this AI or ML is going to punch with the, our technology, the code technology basically. Because as I told that I am a mechanical engineer, I am in the mechanical engineering department. So when uh, earlier days, when you used to talk about the mechanical engineer, so something it is coming to our mind is that mechanical. Oh, that means it is having some hammer, it is having some saw, it is having some chisel, something like that, right? So electronics, oh, that means they are going to discuss about certain kind of <clears throat> your TV, some kind of board or some kind of something like that. Computer means those who are only uh, relating with the computer itself. But nowadays, this all these things are the interrelated one. So many different topics has come and people are basically tending towards those topics because it is basically the interstructure in between this mechanical and electronics, some mechanotronics has come. So now nanoscience, nanotechnology, people are working on this particular area all the applications so computer people are also working electronics people are also working mechanical working material science people are working so now that's days gone that only the civil engineering means only the sand or maybe the cement kind of things mechanical means only the hammer so today actually my topic is that how we can interpret all these ai ml and the internet things with the digital manufacturing because nowadays the digital manufacturing will come so before going to share my slides, because uh, why I am telling all these things, then only we can understand basically where we are standing over there and how we can uh, do. So in my school days, even if I uh, college days, not school days, basically college uh, school days, nothing was there. When my college in my second year, I remember that in this particular college, the internet has that only been started in the year of maybe 98 99 99 i am talking about and then there we are having one computer room where we are having that internet facility so we used to go over there we used to give certain amount and of course it is a very nominal charges because that time the internet cost was too high that i know so basically we need to book for maybe half an hour for 50 rupees or something like, like that. We need to uh, book the slots, then we need to use the internet. Sometimes it may happen that internet is very fast. Sometimes it is, you cannot open a single mail. And if I remember that I have started my fast internet kind of things with the USA.net. So that time this Google Yahoo was not so, so ready was they started. So some kind of, this kind of internet, uh, provider was there so we have started the career and of course that time mobile phone was not there because i got the mobile phone when i was doing my phd basically that is in the year of 2005 or 2006 it has come and that time also incoming call also we need to give the money so people were trying to give the miss call and that that habit is still continuing still it is free so the thing is that uh, and the mobile internet was also not available. So why I am telling this story that how we are changing everything with our life because that time only we are thinking that anything, any subject, any core branches, 
is only related to that one. So no internet connections, nothing we have connected with the internet or maybe any kind of technology. So later, slowly, slowly, we have developed, we have developed everything. Now we are trying to make it artificial intelligence, the machine learning. That means we are trying to uh, give you that the machine can think like a human being and they can perform well. So one of the best example uh, or maybe the thing I can tell you that two days back, there was one result in the Australian Open, right? So it was around 7-2, 2 The Nadal was basically in the third state also. So he was almost going to lose. And that time I saw that AI predictions. So AI predictions was around 96% that Nadal will lose that particular match. But after that, suddenly he wins. So now the question is that, of course, we are depending upon this artificial intelligence, we are depending upon the machine learning, but still we are not up to that much level because we, behind this we need lots of research, lots of speculations, identifications. So to reach that particular point that where it can give you the 100% uh, uh, proof uh, means uh, predicting 100% uh, proper predictions of that particular result. Still, the human intervention is required. So now let me allow to share my slides so that we'll uh, start to the today's presentations. So basically, uh, my today's presentations, as I told already, so I am going to give it on the integrations of the artificial intelligence and the machine learning with digital manufacturing. So I hope you are uh, able to see my yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, slides. Yeah. So as I told already, so basically Internet of Things. So Internet of Things means we are trying to use or maybe add certain kind of technology over there. So we are trying to add the artificial intelligence and the machine learning with the digital manufacturing. So what is manufacturing basically? So manufacturing means we are going to prepare something, right? We are pre going to prepare. It's not about the mechanical. It's about everywhere. Say, suppose nowadays people are working on the memes, people are working on the sensors, people are working on some certain chips also. So that is also that we are following certain kind of fabrication process. So in that fabrication process also, we are trying to do. So basically what we are doing, so we are having certain kind of raw materials and we are going to give certain kind of particular shapes either by different techniques over there. So suppose if I talk about the electronics point of view, we are doing the soldering, we are doing certain kind of brazing from mechanical point of view also, we are doing certain kind of fixing, some joining, some welding. So, so it is everywhere. So computer also, nowadays, uh, earlier days when we are the students of so that time, basically the Pentium one. So now we have go beyond the Pentium four. So some octa-core processor has come. So some new processor has come. Now we are getting high uh, core processor uh, computing systems also. So now everything is getting faster. Not only that, now our whole financial systems has become the digital. The digitization has been started and we are almost into the transition phase because now everything. Now, uh, uh, if I remember that nowadays, maybe in a month, uh, sometimes it may happen that in a month also I never used to visit any ATM branches over there. But still I am purchasing the uh, uh, household items and all these things. Everybody we are doing. So so we are using so many apps over there. Paytm we are having, we are having Veeam, we are having Google Pay, we are having Phone Pay. So now the digitization has been come. I am not going into that because every kind of uh, uh, applications, every kind of uh, things, of course, there is certain pros and cons. Everything is having certain advantages and certain disadvantages too. But still, slowly, slowly, we are adapting all these things because uh, when uh, this kind of techniques has come, so that time we are thinking that how we can do it. We need high, very high uh, um, uh, spec uh, computer. We need very memory. We need continuous internet. So now everything is slowly, slowly settled down and we are uh, basically learning and we are uh, adopting those techniques in our day to day life. So. Uh, as I told already, so manufacturing, either it may be the manually we can do, so the labor and everything, the people, worker, so operator, so we need a lots of uh, people interventions. And of course, it will be a overall uh, uh, teamwork where we can fabricate certain kind of products. So suppose if I talk uh, about any car, suppose a Maruti or maybe the Hyundai or maybe some Mahindra. So you can find there are n number of people are working 
and they are working into the different areas and then ultimately that everybody's approach is coming and just concentrating on a particular point and one car is basically they are producing so somebody is working into the welding zone somebody is painting somebody is inking somebody is body shop so everywhere so now when i am talking about the digital manufacturing so digital manufacturing of course sometimes some of the process we it has been digitized basically so either maybe the computer of course the computer we need certain kind of programming we need certain kind of software but there are certain so many good advantages of this particular technology so what is that use of computer based system to create a product via the manufacturing a collaborative approach in product and the process design yes earlier days we i remember that when i um, was a student so the our teacher basically they used to teach us about that autocad right so that time whatever we felt that at the initial stage we thought it is very very difficult because we need to know certain kind of coding and all these things but nowadays so many softwares has come where you don't need no need to do any kind of coding probably you no need to have certain kind of proper computer knowledge over there but simple you can give the command and machine will perform everything in terms of the design in terms of the fabrications even if they can do at the any time they can do the testing they can cut the material they can do the cross section they can tell you whatever the properties even if they can do the live predictions of that particular components also so like this way basically we are adapting all this technology to our manufacturing so it enables manufacturing engineers to provide the immediate feedback to designers if there are constraints in the part manufacturability yes true so now before going to manufacture you know that whether it is possible or not if it will possible if it will come to the market what how it will react to the customer how the customer will react onto it what are the problems it may face so before going to waste certain money before going to waste your time you are going to get the informations that how this material can work into the system what will be the advantage of using those materials and how the it will go or maybe run for a longer time into the market itself now <clears throat> what are the digital market, um, manufacturing allows basically so shortening of the development time and the cost which i was talking about integration of knowledge coming from different manufacturing process and departments it's true because now everything is software based if somebody is doing something from uh, suppose welding point of view they are giving certain kind of feedback automatically that feedback within a fraction of a second it is going to the assembly section so if this part is faulty what will be the remedy what we can do or maybe how it has been prepared so now everything is over there nowadays even if uh, all the informations also we are making it digitally right so all the informations and uh, probably uh, from this year onwards our passport will also start become the e passport so this the thing so uh, on a small thing no need to carry because for that you need to carry so many equipments and all these things and <coughs> sorry if you are having any kind of uh, this kind of technology all the informations can be gathered so for that you no need to put any kind of diary any kind of logbook kind of things so everything is on the internet basically <clears throat> so decentralized manufacturing of the increasing variety of parts and products in numerous products and sites focusing on manufacturing organizations on their core competence working efficiently with other companies and suppliers on the basis of effective it based cooperative engineering so that it information technology it has already been boomed and now it is continuing and of course in the near future it will help us in all other aspects too now what are the basic components of the digital manufacturing so if i talk about that we are having so many softwares and each and every cases basically we are using it so like cad computer aided design cam we are having computer aided manufacturing cap computer aided process planning factory layout planning ergonomics MRP manufacturing resource planning, ERP enterprise resource planning, computer simulation techniques, supply chain management, and the e-commerce systems. So everywhere you can see that our basically the artificial intelligence or maybe the AI or rather I can say that internet is overall uh, attached because without any applications, 
internet is nothing right internet when we need suppose we want to do something suppose we want to book the tickets so, so simply we'll go to the google and go to that proper site we can purchase the ticket suppose we want to get an, or to know certain information so simple we'll go to the google simple we'll write it down all the informations will come and google also it is a fantastic thing so that means it is and basically the library basically the source but how it is working with the help of that particular internet so unless and until we are going to utilize that particular thing so there is no need of that particular uh, technology so cad the computer aided design so simple words i'll tell you that so that everybody can understand so use of computers to aid in the creations modifications analysis or optimizations of a design cad software generally nowadays uh, every year basically it is getting modified and of course we are getting the newer version and of course in the newer version we are getting some added features also there so that it is becoming more easy more handy more useful to the operators and of course it is very very well uh, conversant to the all kind of, of uh, people over there so cad software are used to increase the productivity of the designer improve the quality of design improve communications through documentation to create a database for manufacturing i can tell you where maximum cases generally cad maximum cases we are using for the automobile industry why i am giving the example of the automobile industry that's why because only because of that that everybody can understand so we are seeing that different types of cars has come into the market itself right so earlier days when you see the cars that was not particularly the compactness was there but nowadays the whatever the car is coming every car is having a proper compactness right nowadays acv has come so now the government is also impinging so many rules for now selling the car you need to give at least seven, six number of seat uh, your uh, safety bag so if every features they are adding and the car company they are very quickly basically they are adding all these features nowadays probably you have heard that last couple of months a huge um, uh, advertisement was coming from the mahindra itself when they are going to launch about that um, xuv 700 right so they have added so many features and one of the features is called the adas so adas is something like that that features they are trying to impose it from that particular uh, uh tesla car basically so when you are feeling certain kind of bore or maybe feeling sleepy so automatically your seat whatever the driver seat basically it is going to give you certain kind of vibration kind of things so that means it is getting the information so while driving also it is getting the so many signals from the driver point of view also and also it is trying to judge the driver mentality driver mental conditions so everything it is going to judge and give you the information so that, that means what we are training those particular equipment in such a manner that it can judge even if us also that where our we are feeling sleepy or maybe we are into the steady state where our uh, and not only that they put certain kind of automatic brake uh, brake kind of things also so automatically when the speed is going to be fluctuate so car is going to break it automatically so so many features they have promised some of the features they have already given or maybe some near future all the features is going to add so now they have launched so now only one company has launched now people are going to use it if people will find it so automatically its demand will be more so then the other company will start also start giving all those features to sell their car otherwise no, we are not going to purchase any other different company car so my example is only such a that that when you are giving any kind of technology so why what you are doing you are doing with some something cat design or something like that to make it compact in that particular shape you need to accommodate all the parts over there and how it can perform without giving any trouble to that particular driver or maybe the owner so CAD output is often in the form of electronic files for print, matching and other manufacturing operations that we know basically. Then CAM, so computer aided manufacturing, so use of software and computer control machinery to automate a manufacturing process, use of software to control machine tools related ones in the manufacturing of the workpiece. So now in this case, we have done certain kind of modeling. Now act as per that coding, as per the instructions, that particular machine is going to perform that particular task. 
So suppose I have given that you cut two millimeters, so it will automatically cut two millimeter, not it is 2.01 or maybe 1.99. So like this way, basically we are controlling, but if we do it manually, so we are the human, right? So when we are going or maybe in the morning sections, even if for me also. So suppose today morning uh, we are having, uh, I was having two classes and after that I am taking this lecture, I am having another lecture from two to three. So at the morning when I came over here, I was having the full up energy. But maybe after the lunch or something like that, after taking this particular three lecture, I will be getting some kind of tired. So automatically, maybe at the evening, my tiredness level will be maximum. So that time, maybe whatever I am going to do, maybe there is a chance of error. But if I am fully dependent upon some machine, some equipment, so automatically there will be no chance that it will get tired or maybe there will be some error in the fabrications or maybe in the production point of view. So it may also refer to the use to, of a computer to assist in all operations of a manufacturing plant, including planning, management, transportations, and the storage. So what are the some key benefits? So basically the some key benefits of using the CAM systems are faster production process, components and tooling with more precise dimensions and material consistency, which I was talking about, use only required amount of raw material. So minimizing the waste because it has been already calculated but fabricating these particular techniques or maybe joining these particular techniques how much material is exactly required reduces the energy consumption then cap computer aided process planning so use of computer technology to add in the process of planning of a part of a product in manufacturing is the link between cad and cam in in that it provides for the planning so basically these all are the provider the, basically the service provider to us factory layout planning design assembly lines equipment and tool requirements in a 3d environment optimize factory space maximize capital resource utilization of digitally configuring factory outlets so where i can put how many machines i am going to put where the operator will stand where the electricity is required where the water line is required where the gas pipeline is required so before going to start everything nowadays we are doing even if Forget about the industry, simple in our house, in our home also, when we are going to do certain kind of painting, that painting also before going to put in the wall, they are taking the image of that our wall and they are putting into the software. They are showing us that if you put this particular color, so it will look like this. If we put this color, so it will look like this. So every information, not only that, they are going to tell us about that conditions of that particular material also condition of the particular wall also even if nowadays uh, suppose when you are going to purchase anything any clothes or anything to the internet itself so suppose if you go to some uh, spectacles uh, uh, that app we are having so there you, if you choose it it's a simple digitally they are taking your image and they are putting that particular specs onto your eyes and they are showing you how you will be looking like so that means what so before going to know if i am going because if unless and until if i earlier days if unless and until i'll purchase it if i will not use it so i cannot see that how it will be looking like so now from the sitting from a particular place no need to go to the shop you are going to get that how you are going to looking like so that is basically the internet things or maybe the digital things has come into our life Ergonomics, application of psychological and physiological principles of the engineering and design of products process. So health monitoring, basically. So health monitoring of the equipment, health monitoring of the product, even if health monitoring of the operator too. So everything, so every details, what are the psychological states, what are the physiological principles about this design, about this product, about this process, about these systems. Then MRP, Manufacturing Resource Planning, a method for the effective planning of all resources of a manufacturing company, financial and operational planning in units. It has a simulation capability of answer what if. That means material requirement planning. So if it will choose you uh, or maybe it will give you the different paths. Suppose you are following the path A, if there will be any problem, so it will come back and it will follow the path B. 
so that it will reduce the time, it will give you the instantaneous results. ERP enterprise resource planning software and systems used to plan and manage all the core supply chain manufacturing. So it is after preparing because how you are going to supply. Now you can find that whenever any product is coming, the main and foremost challenge is over there, how I can reach to all the people. So that means suppose I am formulating that particular product over here. So in Rurki, so I, my first attempt will be that how I reach this particular product to Konnakumari. How I uh, first I will reach that or, uh, or maybe send that particular product to maybe Jammu or maybe the interior Kashmir or maybe the interior village side. So unless and until I will able to send that product, I will not give them the proper after sale service. So my product is not going to sell. My product is not going to be uh, uh, taken by the customer. So these all are the basically the planning that also we need to do before launching it. Computer simulation techniques, simulation based technologies constitute a focal point. Now it has been everywhere computer simulation, even if for big, big operations like heart operations, like any kind of orthopedic implants. So before going to do so, basically, we are using certain kind of simulation techniques and we are get, going to get all the information. Supply chain management and e-commerce systems. So now it is so many e-commerce systems has come, Amazon has come, right? So from the home only you are giving the order and it is coming to your doorstep. So, so many others, uh, all the companies, all the shops, all the brands, basically nowadays they are following the e-commerce systems over there. And you are also paying the money digitally. So everything is nowadays is the digital one. Even if they are having that options also, if you don't fill, they are also going to pick it up and then again, they are going to change it after a certain time. Now, what are the key advantages? As I told already, first is digital manufacturing helps manufacturing companies improve productivity. Then enable product, process, plant, resource information to be associated, viewed, and taken through change process. Then flexible work instructions capable of displaying the 2D, 3D. So nowadays we are asking all the images in 3D too. Then allows part manufacturing, reduce commissioning cost through simulation by validating robotics automation program helps in creating factory models faster then support six sigma and lean initiatives by the providing a graphical environment to analyze facilities the sharing of quality data across your organization by generating complete variable cad executes production process with real time access of life cycle data so these all are the things now what are the manufacturing equipment in uh, dm basically so Numerical control and computer numerical control machine tools, automated welding machines, industrial robots, coordinate me measuring machines, basically where we are going to check our parts, shape, size, dimension, and everything. Now, what is numerical control and computer numerical control machine tools? So NC and CNC is the automated control of machine tools, such as drill, lathe, mills, 3D printers, a CNC machine pro process a piece of material like metal, plastic, wood, ceramic composites to meet specifications. Uh, sometimes we are writing that particular software, we are doing the coding, we are inserting that one in the machine itself and then machine is doing the whole thing over there. So this is one simple example. See, I am not going to full because due to the time constraint. So we have given all the things over there. It is totally CNC based. So the machine is performing accordingly that we have given step by step. So fire, so you need to do these operations. Then again, you need to do these operations. So like this way, the machine will perform. We no need to check or maybe we don't need to see. So everything can be done and can be possible. So no human interventions is there. You see how complex steps basically it is making. So it has been formed and it has been taken out. 
now automated welding machines also same thing in the car company car industry nowadays widely we are using this kind of automated industry so continuously uh, people, uh robots basically the arms they are doing so sometimes it is fully automatic sometimes maybe it is the semi automatic kind of things and not only that we have just given so one by one step because at a time all the welding will be not, not taking place so one by one the automatically welding will be taking place so it is basically taking care by this industrial robots right hand side image you can find that in the automobile industry how we are using so many industrial robots over there so every robot is having a single arm over there and every arm is performing the different task over there and now this is totally holding by a robot itself the monitor itself so now it is checking that whether it is properly done or not or maybe if there is any fault do you think that all these things very quickly can be done by us it's impossible so or that means what the cost has been reduced and of course the production time has been reduced drastically not only that the material handling material transfer because we are the human being we are having certain uh, constraint up to certain level we can bear the load after that we cannot but machine that can bear any kind of load over there processing operations welding painting palletizing assembly and inspections like assembly disassembly product inspection testing packaging and the labeling kind of things then coordinate measuring machines so after preparing the equipment whatever the shape and size if there is any error if the error within the tolerance limit or not so everything can be measured and can come to the computer itself so precisely because sometimes while we are measuring maybe we are not not able to measure the exact dimensions exact length exact width but the machine will give you in very accurate manner maybe into some nanometer level also now basic introductions of the artificial intelligence so as i told already so artificial intelligence as an academic discipline was founded in the year of 1956 that means it is not to uh, new so goal then as now was to get computers to perform tasks regarded as uniquely human things that required intelligence so that means we are putting our brain into the system so system will think decide and act so basically in this particular case they are going to take all the decisions that what they have to do and how they need to do so computers simulate the human thought process ai means getting a computer to mimic human behavior in some way the computer is doing something intelligent so it's exhibiting intelligence that is artificial so the earlier use of artificial intelligence was image recognition so nowadays if you see and simply if you want to take certain image through the mobile and uh, probably nowadays uh, in the smart mobile we are having that particular feature so if that person image already we have taken earlier so it can easily recognize that when we have taken what was the dimensions we have used what was the color we have used what was the settings basically we have used extracting meaning from the text itself so now the machine learning so difference between the human and computers so human learn from past experience at least they try computers or machine need to be told what to do so basically our learning is something like that we are doing something we are facing certain problems from solving those problems we are learning that how to modify that particular process but computer computer already we have given if this problem will occur you need to do this if this will come so you need to react like this so everything is, oh, we are putting over there and that machine is doing like so so computers are strict logic machines with zero common sense that means if we want them to do something we have to provide them with detailed step by step instructions on early what to do and we write scripts and programs for computers to follow those instructions so few days back basically another example i am telling you so few days back basically i went to go nasa i uh, sorry isro so in the isro basically they are working with the nasa for one particular project that is called the gaganjaan so they want to send the first robot over there and in that robot they are putting all this artificial intelligence over there so in that all artificial intelligence they are that means what when it will reach over there it will working as like a human 
brain and then it is going to collect all the informations analyzing all the informations if they it will face certain kind of problems automatically it will think by yourself and it will take the right call over there so like this way basically they are going to send uh, all these kind of things for the future the process of learning and of begins with observations or data such as examples direct experience or instructions in order to look for partners uh, sorry patterns in india and make better decisions in the future based on the examples that we provide machine learning concept consists of getting computers to learn from experience past data so what is machine learning as defined by arthur lee samuel in the year of 1959 machine learning is a field of study concerned with giving computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed so sometimes it can sense also so that basically the brain because in our case we are not doing any kind of coding in our mind right so automatically we are reacting according to the environment so that also the same thing we are doing trying to replicate into the brain of that particular computer or maybe the robot so basically machine learning makes computer more intelligent without explicitly teaching them how to behave machine learning has revolutionized countless industries it is the underlying technology for many apps in our smartphone from virtual assistants like siri to predicting traffic patterns with the google maps so machine learning is one of the way to achieve the artificial intelligence now what are the machine learning uh, learning methods so first is called the supervised machine learning algorithms it can apply what has been learned in the past to new data using the labeled examples to predict future events unsupervised machine learning algorithms unsupervised machine learning algorithms are used when its information used to train is neither classified nor labeled so one is that the classified informations one is called the non classified informations so basically one we are going to supervise one we are not going to supervise that particular algorithms <coughs> semi supervised so both label and unleveled data for the training itself and when i am talking about the reinforcement so basically the reinforcement machine learning algorithm is a learning method that interacts with its environment by producing actions and discovers errors or maybe the reorders where basically we are having that control feedback control loop over there so trial and error search because i am doing something but i am finding it is error so basically again i am going to try it so like this so several times multiple times i am going to do that one and then i am going to match with the proper results delayed reward are the most relevant characteristics of reinforcement learning over there so some common applications of the ai so basically personalized coupons or product suggestions we receive after shopping online ai based self parking or self driving cars tesla has come virtual assistants like siri alexa is there social media news feed chatbots trading and investment traffic management etc where basically nowadays we are applying that artificial intelligence and we hope in the near future we are going to utilize in every places so role of the artificial intelligence in modern terms generally refers to computer systems that mimic the human cognitive functions over there so it comprises independent learning and problem solving so basically what we are trying to do we are trying to incorporate the brain inside the machine itself so decision making solve complex problems perform the big high level computations and increase up to the accuracy so ai driven system can discover patterns trends so everything so everything the ai driven patterns can do but the thing is that of course it is also having certain loopholes till now so use of ai in the manufacturing so where basically we are using that ai so artificial intelligence based startups are being developed machine vision tools that detect microscopic defects in products at resolution well beyond the human vision means our eye is also having certain limitations so after beyond that limitations we cannot measure anything but a microscope or maybe the microscope can do anything over there and even if it can go into the nano level too 
The machine vision tools use a machine learning algorithm tested on small volumes of sample images. The computer not only sees the errors, but process the information and learns from it observes basically. So objects, conveyor belts, the continuously machine parts is moving and continuously this machine basically is taking the image, analyzing it. And if it is getting certain faulty image, so automatically this, I, this arm will come and it will throw it out. So there is a negligible chances of error basically. In 2014, China, Japan, the United States, the Republic of Korea, Germany together contributed to 70% of the total sales volume of robots. In the automotive industry, a sector with a particularly high degree of automation, Japan had the highest density of industrial robots. Yes, of course, they are the basically the stalwarts for using the robots in the world at 1414 per 10,000 employees. So 1414 per 10,000 employees, they are using the robot. So industries have begun delivering the vision of integrating software and artificial intelligence into every phase of the manufacturing cycle. Generative design approach in manufacturing. So a new trend basically it is coming out. So designer of engineers specify design goals as well as material parameters, manufacturing methods and cost constraints into the generative design software. Then software will do accordingly. It will take the call that I'm, I am having this much of amount, this much of uh, material, this much of this process. So how we can do it? So the software explores all potential permutations for a feasible solutions and it will give you maybe five or 10 number of solutions and you choose the best. The software also uses machine learning to test and learn from each iterations to test which iterations work and which iterations fail basically. So applying AI and ML in robotics. So already I have given the examples that every industry nowadays we are using the robot for getting the maximum production rate and early solutions. Four tenets of artificial intelligence and machine learning in robotics are vision, grasping, motion control, and of course the data. So that is basically the scope of AI in the robotics includes. So what is visions? AI is helping robots detect items they have never seen before and recognize objects with far greater detail. Grasping, robots are also grasping items they have never seen before with AI and machine learning helping them determine the best position and orientation to grasp an object. Yes, proper location selection, proper selection of the location. Motion control, machine learning helps robots with dynamic interactions and obstacle avoidance to maintain the productivity. And of course, the data, AI and machine learning both help robots understand physical and logistical data patterns to be proactive and act accordingly. So I am giving certain kind of examples. So supply chain and logistics applications are seeing some of the first implementation of AI and machine learning in robotics. A robotic arm is responsible for handling frozen cases of food that are covered in the frost. Where human intervention is not at all possible. The frost causes the shape of the objects to change. The robot is not just presented different parts occasionally. It is being continuously presented with differently shaped parts also. So if the shape and size is also going to be changed, it can detect easily that also. AI helps the robot detect and grasp this object despite the variation in the shape. Picking and placing a large volume of different part types in a warehouse. This volume of part types would not be profitable to automate without machine learning. But now engineers can regularly feed robots image of new parts and the robot can then successfully grasp these part types. So we are giving the instruction simply it is going and it is bringing that particular part itself. AI and machine learning will have a transformative impact on industrial robots. While these technologies are still in their infancy, they will continue to push the boundaries of what's possible with industrial robotic automation over the next few decades which is going to rule us basically now what are the advantages of integrating ai and ml with digital manufacturing so ai driven machines ensure an easier manufacturing process along with many other benefits at each new stage of advancement technology creates new potential for task automations while increasing intelligence of human and machine interpretations 
Some benefits of AI include direct automation, 24 into 7 production, safer operational environments, and reduced operating cost. It will execute the actions repeatedly without any error. 24 into 7 uh, preparations, so that means it will continuously do all the operations over there and meet the higher demands. Safer operational environment, fewer human lab uh, laborers performing dangerous and strenuous tasks. If we employ certain kind of robots, certain kind of main, uh, uh, your <coughs> machines, which can do accurately, so automatically the human intervention will be less. One simple example, every year there are so many people are dying when they are going to clean our sewer, simple, the roadside, sewer channel. So now if we put certain, certain robot, because there is certain kind of toxic gases generating inside it, right? In the petroleum industry, in the acid industry. So basically, there where the hum human is continuously dying. We can do it by simple applying the robot itself. So we can save the thousands of lives over there. Reduce the operating cost, environmental impacts. So self-driving cars are potentially beneficial to the environment. They can be programmed to navigate the most efficient route and reduce the idle time. Additional benefits, quick data-driven de decisions, advanced process effectiveness, minimize operational cost, facilitate product development, and enable the excessive scalability. Disadvantage, now it is high cost that I admit, but when we are going to increase this number, or so many places we are going to increase, so automatically the production will be higher, that time the overall cost is going to be reduced, maybe after certain time. Reduce employment opportunity. Yes, that's true. Job opportunity will grow with the advent of AI. However, some jobs might be lost because of AI would replace them. AI decision making due to possibility of and programming error. The simulation arising can be dangerous in the heavy industry where one mistake can cause lives or cause injury. Environmental impacts. Only 20% of electronic waste was recycled in 2016 despite 67 nations having enacted e-waste legislation. Electronic waste is expected to reach 52.2 million tons in the year of 2021. The manufacture of digital device and other electronics goes hand in hand with AI development, which is poised to damage the environment. That's true. That we are using the computer, we are using the so many machines. When it is not working, just simply we are throwing. After that, basically we are not thinking where basically it is going. How we are storing all these things? So electronic waste is a big, big problem, environmental problem nowadays. In AI-driven cars, one mistake can cause uncontrolled emission by fuel consumption. AI trained to act and environmental variables might have inner, er, erroneous algorithms, which can lead to potentially negative effects on the environment. When machines develop learning and decision-making ability that is not coded by a programmer, the mistakes can be hard to trace and see. As such, the management and scoop of AI based process are essential. So this is all about my lecture. So thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. So that's all. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable insights on embedding the recent technologies in digital manufacturing, as well as the implementation of intelligence into mechanics and some other techniques also. Once again, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I am profusely overjoyed to take the opportunity to introduce our second keynote speaker of ICNG IoT 2022, Dr. Aninda Bose, Senior Editor, Springer Nature. Dr. Bose is responsible for publication of scientific books in the field of applied sciences, including topics on interdisciplinary applied science, computational intelligence, intelligent computing, communication, system and security, energy and water. His portfolio includes monograph, edited volumes, professional books, textbook, atlases, and conference proceedings. I would like to welcome Dr. Aninda Bose for the keynote talk. Dr. Bose, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you all can hear me. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. yeah thank you. 
Uh, it was a fantastic talk by Dr. Paul. I was very much enjoying the talk, you know. But Dr. Paul, thank you for thank showing you. all these uh, robotic parts, you know. That is, uh, I had an opportunity actually, you know, a couple of years ago, I visited Oxford BMW Mini Workshop. And it was such an eye opener at that time, you know, where looking at machines are doing uh, all the activities and so customized cars are getting manufactured over there with such a small change in the specifications. True. But uh, there is another unfortunate part also attached to it, which you have highlighted in your one of the slides over here that there is a loss of uh, labor, you know, and uh, initially that uh, factory used to have 25,000 people and now only 500 people or 600 people are working in the plant and some 2000 people are only employed all over the plant so it is a huge uh, you know uh, change in the uh, employees but definitely it's an eye opening experience which we had over there so do we have anything in india at this point in yes true. we are doing we are doing now all the companies has been started so okay. that's why okay. i have given the examples of the mahindra so okay. the mahindra xuv 700 now they are using these kind of techniques extensively Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank yeah, you. I will come back to my presentation now. And uh, this is basically a presentation on uh, publishing ethics, which is very close to my heart. And uh, there are certain author services also I will highlight in this presentation. Let me just share my presentation. I hope you all can see the presentation right now, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So as I said, the presentation is on publishing ethics and author services. So publishing ethics is, as I said, is very close to my heart because I feel the community in which you are working, you should be very ethical with your work. And that is more important because I know you people are very disciplined and very curious because all scientists and all researchers are. But ethics is equally important and uh, there are certain author services I will also mention after uh, during my presentation, you know, uh, which are very useful for your regular activities as well as for your reference purposes. See, I come from an organization which is called Springer. I hope you all know Springer is a publisher uh, of choice and we are basically in this industry for uh, for almost 180 years. It started in 1842. As a small bookshop, the person you can see on the slide, Julius Springer, he has actually started this uh, small shop in Berlin. Then eventually we became you know, publisher of uh, many uh, Nobel laureates. And then uh, on, in 1924, after the First World War, you know, we moved out of Berlin and we opened our first uh, second office in Vienna. That is, uh, you know, the dynamics of Europe was very different at that time. And Vienna was very... Uh, cultural hub for all the people and uh, a lot of artists and a lot of authors were used to stay there and after uh, the second world war we opened our the biggest office which we have which is also our editorial office that is in Heidelberg so right now we have almost 10,000 plus colleagues and we are operating from 50 different countries and the name of the company has been changed from Springer to Springer Nature if you have uh, observed over a period in last five six years in 2015, we had a collaboration with Macmillan Science and Education and the name of the company changed and the pioneer journal, which is called Springer, is now part of Springer Nature. So the company is also known as Springer Nature. See, our role is mostly in academic book publishing. We are into journals and academic book publishing and we will talk about mostly about book publishing over here. We are one of the largest academic book publisher in the world and uh, we publish books all across science, technology and medicine. We started with engineering and mathematics and we are one of the pioneers in mathematics publication. But in last 30 uh, odd years, we have uh, moved to humanities also. You know, we have included humanities, we have included social sciences. And uh, recently we have a joint venture with an organization called Paul Grave. Paul Grave is a very big name in social sciences. People who are working in behavioral science, they know. We publish a huge number of books each year. That is almost 13,000 plus books. 
we have more than 3 lakh books available on our content platform which is called springer.com as well as springer link which is our content platform so we are one of the pioneers in digital publishing but we have realized in last two years you know the, how important is digital publishing because of pandemic it was highly the publishing was highly impacted especially the print media was heavily impacted because uh, shops were not open uh, printing was closed and we were able to reach our uh, you know readers or researchers through digital content only and huge number of uh, downloads have happened and this is what actually uh, shown us that how important is a digital content is and how much uh, you know popular it is among the researchers and how they basically download the content and how they work on it so this has really opened our eyes also but at the same time we are always there with so many uh, books on our platform that it helped us that we started uh, way back almost 30 years ago so it easily we managed to you know uh, give uh, the content to the readers Coming to the first section, so the term copyright is very, very, uh, you know, uh, popular and you all know that copyright is very important. The definition mentioned over here is not that important. The important is basically the logo which is uh, present here. I want to highlight that logo to you, especially I would in the whole presentation, I would like to uh, show you or take you, give you certain inputs which you can go back and check you know that is the whole idea behind it because in half an hour's time you cannot uh, teach anyone anything but definitely you can tell them about certain things where they can go and they can check on their own so one of the websites which you should as a researcher should check is cope which is committee on publication ethics if you go to that website you will find a lot of data is there related to copyright and especially the data related to different aspects of ethical publication and in very lucid language many case studies are there many uh, important uh, information are there so it will be a good read and good understanding and over a period of time you can go back to that uh, website again and again and you can see there are new things gets added new uh, comments there they come and you can also chat with other people so cope uh, all good publishers are member of cope and we also deal all unethical activities according to the cope guidelines so it is very important for you to know cope and to see what exactly cope offers now, what is the most occurring reason for retraction? Uh, if we talk about uh, retraction as a whole, what exactly is retraction? That is first thing you have to understand. Retraction means something, you know, taking back. Now, taking back what? Uh, the one thing which is published, you know, a, uh, an article or a chapter or a conference proceedings paper which is published online, there is a possibility that we can take it down from the digital platform. This was not possible when we were dealing with uh, hard copies or print copies because we, you cannot go to the buyer or the purchaser and take the book back and do a retraction retraction is only possible for digital content now when we were doing retraction over a period of time we have done many retractions and many publishers have done it so there is a survey which was done and we tried to see what exactly is the reason for retraction you know so the first reason which is the highest uh, you know, uh, percentage of thing which is present in the data is like honest error. You know, honest error is something which is very, uh, again, an eye opener for us. Why there is an honest error? It says 40% people are doing committing this error without the knowledge of policy. You know, that is why I said you have to go to COPE. You need to read because many people are actually committing many errors during their publication process because they don't know the policies and the guidelines well. The second reason you can see is fabrication and falsification. That is almost 28%. So that means that data is available. And with the uh, you know internet available for last 20, 22 years, it is like much easier to get data. And you have to understand that the data is which is available over there is basically if it is published by someone, it's not free. It is not that you can go and you can use it or you can fabricate it or falsify it. So that is a big, big unethical activity. Then redundant publication, that means self-plagiarism, that you are plagiarizing your own work, you are publishing it again, and there are some other reasons also. You'll see these uh, things in detail also. So importantly, another aspect is simultaneous submission, and simultaneous submission is, again, very unethical. Now, what exactly is simultaneous submission? That means submitting the same proposal 
if I'm talking about a book proposal to the multiple publishers at the same time, or if I'm talking about a journal article, that means submitting the same article to different journals at the same time. Now, why this is unethical? Because, you know, you will say I'm just submitting the article or I'm just submitting the chapter or submitting the book to the uh, publisher and I'm not publishing it. But it is unethical. The reasons are very simple. It's a waste of time, effort and resource. It's a waste of time, effort and resource. Which resource? The resource is very important here. Resource is reviewers. Now, this is a very interesting industry. If I talk about it, you know, you will find it very interesting in a way. This is a triangle. There is a triangle over here. Like we have authors and we have readers, correct? Now, all these authors who are writing, they are also the readers because they are only downloading and reading the content also. And both these authors and readers, they are also having a role of reviewing the work. That means they are reviewing the content. So they are reviewers. So what exactly is happening when you are doing a simultaneous submission, when you are sending your proposal to different publishers at the same time, different publishers are approaching reviewers. And these reviewers are not many. You know, if you look at your own discipline or your area, very restricted number of reviewers are there. So if reviewers are getting, you know, same proposal from different people and they are working on the same proposal or same article it's a huge waste of time and effort that is why simultaneous submission is not ethical so what is the solution you submit the article or submit the book to a publisher see how they deal with it in case you are not happy with it the way you are basically looking forward to your expectation is not met or you think that your paper is not getting uh, you know uh, reviewed in it on time then you should withdraw that at least you should mail give a mail to the publisher that I want to withdraw my article and then you can send it to some other journal or you can send your book to some other publisher. There is another unethical activity which is called plagiarism and I hope you all know about this particular terminology plagiarism. Plagiarism means you know using someone else's work without taking permission. Now, why plagiarism is very bad? Plagiarism is very bad because it, it, the work belongs to someone else and you are not actually giving any recognition to that person and you are trying to use that work with your name and with give, without giving acknowledgement so there are uh, terminologies nowadays people use uh, you know similarity overlapping and uh, interestingly people don't get you know uh, uh, offended when you say your work is 60% uh, 70% similar rather than if you say 60% plagiarized but the meaning is very same that means if we, the work is 50% 60% similar also that means you know it is it cannot be used but there is something called fair use and there is a document uh, which present in Google. If you go Association of Research Libraries 2012, this document talks about fair use and there are different uh, documents. Even Cope also talks about the fair use and what exactly is fair use. Fair use means uh, content, how much content you can actually use from someone else's work or your own work, which is already published and without taking permission. So that's a very, very uh, small content which you can use or you can refer to your work but if you are using substantial content figure tables from anyone else's work or from your own published work please take permission I will take tell you how to do that also now, how are we alerted to plagiarism? So if plagiarism is happening in the industry, which is happening very rampantly, and uh, now in last two years we have seen suddenly the quantity has increased heavily, but the quality has decreased also. And because there are lots and lots of cases of plagiarism we are getting. So what exactly is happening when there is a plagiarism? Original author, sometimes they find it because they are also looking at different contents or the content which is like they're similar to their content, you know, something which is more readable for them, which is useful for them. So they find, oh, my content has been copied by someone else. Sometimes by reviewers, very seldom by reviewers because reviewers are there to check the quality of the content rather than the similarity of the content. And then there are researchers, you know, researchers of like uh, whistleblowers who are the readers, you know, they sometimes they read the same content on two different journals or the same content on two, in two different books. And they see, oh, these are the same thing and they alert us. Now, which we know that there is a tool which can actually help to find plagiarism. And I hope you all know about these tools which are there to find plagiarism. But interestingly, these tools, they cannot identify plagiarism, you know they can only give you certain percentages of similarity or similarity index when you run these papers or book chapters in that particular tool. 
So you need a human eye to decide if the content has been plagiarized or not. So that is very important that a subject expert should check. Even if you have certain similarity in the paper, the paper needs to be checked by subject expert to understand whether the work is plagiarized or not. I will give you an example over here. So before that, I will uh, show you the plagiarism checking tool. This is a plagiarism checking tool. One of the tools, this is Authenticate. We use Authenticate in Springer. That is why you can see over here, there are more tools. Turnitin is there, Docolock is there, and there are many available over the over uh, Google freely. You can go to them. But mostly people use Authenticate and Turnitin because the reason is, you know, they have the biggest database coverage and uh, Although it's a very expensive software, it's not cheap. You need to buy license or uh, your institute can buy actually and you can use it. This is how it looks from inside. You know, there are uh, different chapters lined over there with different uh, percentages of uh, similarity. Uh, this is how the paper a uh, paper looks, you know, very colorful, but unfortunately the color is not good over here because the paper is 93% plagiarized with 39% from single source, you can see, correct? So this is a plagiarized paper. Now, if I talk about uh, some tips, you know, that I said the tool cannot detect all problems. And I said the tool is basically there to give you certain similarity index, certain uh, percentages, which needs to be checked by a human eye. Why I'm saying this? Because a low similarity score does not mean there is no plagiarism. That means if I say there are two articles, X and Y. Now, if I run both the articles through this tool, now X, suppose X has 10% similarity and Y has 30% similarity. So when you look at the similarity percentages, it very clearly says Y is more plagiarized than X because it has 30% similarity and X has only 10%. But if a human eye or a subject expert goes deep into that, maybe you find, you know, this 10% is a direct copy from some section of the paper. And this 30% is not a direct copy. It is basically from 30 different sources, different kind of similarities are existing in the paper. So now suddenly, you know, it, the game changes. Now X is more with 10% similarity, is more dangerous than Y, which is ha having 30% similarity. So it is important to look at the individual scores or sources also, not the overall similarity index. And it is very important to see from where the whole thing has been copied. Setting a standard above or below a certain limit index is misusing the tool. Now, this is a question we always face from people, you know, from organizers of conferences, from journal uh, editors and all. What is the standard or a limit we should follow when we look at these numbers? Now, it is very simple. I will tell you anything which is less than 20%, you go and give it to an expert so that they can check. Less than 20%, things can be checked with a human eye, can be reviewed with either reviewer. Beyond 20%, till 30 35%, you please return it to the author and tell them to make changes, make revisions. Anything beyond 35% is basically a big no. That means if the paper already has 35% or 40% similarity with the previous work of someone else or even their own work, so it cannot be published again. Only publications by participating publishers or societies, etc., are in the cross-check database. Now, we're here we are talking about a database, a cross-check database is there, correct? And in cross-check database is basically developed by Authenticate and Turnitin. And if the work is basically a part of this database, then only it will be checked. Otherwise, it is not possible. Suppose something is published in hard copy only or a print version, digital copy is not available at all. Now there is no way you can go and check this, compare this paper or chapter against the digital content because you can check it, but it will not show anything because he has copied or she has copied it from a printed thing. Common phrases are not excluded. Sometimes, you know, you will see their common phrases are used, descriptions are used or algorithms, which are very important for the papers are used. But this is only possible by the human expert to see, okay, these are common phrases or these are like uh, descriptions, which are definitions which are needed, or this is an algorithm which is needed for the paper, even though it has been published before. So these are the calls a subject expert or reviewer can take, a tool cannot take. Text for which permission has been received. So some, to a text which you are using, maybe you have taken the permission from the author or the publisher. But tool is not aware that you have taken the permission. Tool is anyways going to highlight that text as a similarity, correct? So again, a human expert is needed. That is why I'm saying again and again over here, the numbers are not going to tell you anything. The numbers are going to be, you know, give you an 
impression only. Otherwise, you have to go back to the human expert or a subject expert so that they can check the paper, they can check the article clearly and see whether there is any plagiarism or not. Patchwork plagiarism is another type of plagiarism because patchwork is like, you know, you're taking something from somewhere and it is very difficult to uh, find that patchwork plagiarism. But my whole suggestion will be to avoid plagiarism completely. And if you really want to republish something from your work also, please go and take permission. Self plagiarism, as I said, you know, redundant publication, self plagiarism is like, you know, you are actually, you have published something and then you are trying to publish it again. Why this is unethical? Because whatever you have published, you have transferred the copyright to publisher, number one. So copyright of the content is with the publisher, number one. Secondly, something which you have already published is already sold to people by the publisher. So it's already been purchased by readers. Now, if you are reproducing that content again, that means you are basically cheating the readers. You know? So it is not very unethical, uh, sorry, ethical, so that you should avoid self-plagiarism. Data fabrication and falsification, as I said, with internet, you know, uh, there's a lot of data which is available and there is a possibility that people go for these fabrication and falsification and they use it for their own work, which is again very, very unethical. So general advice for me is verbatim copying should be put into quotation marks. If you are taking something from some paper, please put into quotation marks and give permission, uh, take permission, give credit to the original author. Now, if you are writing to the author and author is not aware how to give you permission, it is better to write to the publisher and always request permission for reuse of figures and tables. If you are reusing any figure or any table from someone else's work or from your work, please take permission back and then use it. How to take permission back? Very easy. In this digital world, you go to the chapter from which you are actually going to use the content. If it's your chapter or someone else's chapter, go to the chapter, go below there and you will find, you know, there is a content about this chapter which talks about its DOI, online ISB and everything. And there is a button over there which says or a link over there which says reprints and permissions. So if you click reprints and permissions, you will take it, be taken to a page called rights link. On right link, you have to answer certain questions, you know, where you are going to use the content, who are basically the authors of the content, so whether you are the author of the con next book. So you have certain questions which you have to answer. Mostly, if it is your own paper, there is no charge attached to it. You get the copyright back and then you can reuse it. Now, if it is someone else's work, then there is a possibility that publisher or author, they will charge you something for reuse of the work in case you are getting any kind of royalty or remuneration for your work. If you are not getting any kind of remuneration for your work and you are just reusing it for the purpose of your work, then I don't think you have to pay anything. But taking copyright back is very, very, that means taking permission is very, very important. Coming to my next uh, section of the presentation, that is author services. I will talk about certain services, certain policies. These are the pages or some tools which are like you can go and you can use them. Once you use them, you will understand the you know uh, importance of the tool or uh, what exactly you want, whether it is useful for your work, then you can use it for other purposes also. Firstly, I want to tell you how to reach the editor in Springer. You know, this is a question which comes to us many times and people don't know how to actually go to an editor, how to find an editor. You know, if you go to Springer.com, you will find a button called subjects, you know, a link called subjects. If you go to subjects, you will find all the subjects we are dealing in. It's basically listed over there. Suppose you want to publish anything in mechanical engineering. So you have to go to subjects, you go to the engineering page. Now on engineering page, all the domains of engineering will be listed and you go to mechanical engineering. Once you go to mechanical engineering, you will find the journals, the book series, recent books are listed over there. And also you will find a link which says contacts. And this is available on all subject pages where you will find a link called contacts. So if you go to contacts, you know, you will find the name of the people and you will also find what exactly the areas they are dealing in. If it matches with you, you please write to them. There is a tool called reviewer finder, very interesting tool. So you can go and you can use this tool and see whether it's useful or not. Because nowadays when you actually submit your article for a journal or a book chapter to a, an editor or sometimes a book 
whole book to the publisher then they ask for reviewers you know mandatorily you have to provide some reviewers so this is a tool where you can actually find reviewers and interestingly you know this only not for finding reviewers if you find people who are working in your area in this tool then you can actually collaborate with people also you know networking is very very important and collaboration is the most important thing nowadays so there is a possibility that you can find people whom you can collaborate with with this tool there are pages which are very important uh, if you go to springer.com there is a page called author and reviewer tutorials so you don't have to rush you know there are uh, contents there are videos there are different materials and talk there are guidelines which you can go and read at your own pace so important thing is you should know where to look for it you know if you go to this particular page if you go to springer.com under the springer.com there is a link called services under services you will find journal authors and book authors so if you want to know anything about journal authors, you can go there. If you want to know anything about book authors and editors, you can go to this page and you will find ample of data, ample of information, which you can actually read from time to time. And you can refer also whenever you are in need. This is another tool shared it very, very interesting tool. And this tool is like, you know, uh, started almost three years ago. We started with journal articles and now we are uh, we have moved to conference proceedings. And I think eventually we are going to add it for book chapters also. Now, what is shared it when you publish an article with Springer? Then the production team gives you a link, you know, after the publication is done, he or she shares a link with you or sometimes this link is also available down there at the end of your paper online now what this link is for this link is basically for sharing your work online with people with the community with different readers so you can share the whole paper without any legal issues the reader can actually annotate it they can read it they cannot print it or download it but they can read it whole thing so how this works you know it works in a reverse way also and that is also very interesting suppose you find a paper on springer nature website which you want to download but you cannot because your library or your institute has not subscribed to that no subscription has been done so you can only read abstract you cannot download the whole paper but you can write to the corresponding author please share it with me because they will have the feature available with them as an author of the paper. They can share it with you. And this, this is a very legal way of sharing your work and get some shared content from others also. ORCID ID, I hope you all know this. Researchers, all researchers should have this ID. This is like an Aadhaar card, I always say, for uh, research people. You know, this is this gives you an unique identity to you. And nowadays, many journals and many book publishers are actually asking for your ORCID IDs. This is the best way to get your work recognized you know because uh, when you when there are common names you know there is a possibility that your citation get mixed up but this is not possible when you have an unique id so if you don't have an orcid id please go to orcid website and create an id and use this id for all your work this page is again very very interesting which is talking about policies and if you go to this page springernature.com slash in slash policies you will find there are different type of policies which are available in publication first is publishing policies second is editorial policies third is research data policies because you must be using a lot of data for your work so research data policies are there and recently you know everyone is talking about open science and people are looking forward to open access open data so there is an open access publication policy and what all poli these policies are you can go to this page at your own pace take your time read the content and it will be really really useful this is a featured blog uh, this is a blog called source and this is the source is basically something our uh, marketing team and author service team are basically maintaining this so you can use source for writing your content you can use source for reading the content in different areas uh, you will get a lot of uh, information about career a lot of information about the new happenings in the world so source is a very very rich material which is available free of cost you can go you can actually register and you can get an alert also from source and you can read the content which is available there
before i conclude i always talk about a couple of books which are very useful which are almost necessary i feel for people who are in research first one you can see on the uh, slide how to write and publish a scientific paper this is a book which was written by robert a day now it is continued by barbara gastel uh, ninth edition i think is out this is the copy of uh, photo of eighth edition seventh is i think available online free pdf is available so if you want to download you can go and download that also but this is a must read like people who are doing research, they should know how to write a scientific paper. What are different type of scientific papers? Why you need to write an original paper and not a review paper for something? Why you? What is the difference between a brief communication and an original paper? So this is a very, very good book. And this is a reference material. It is not something like a one time read. It is something where you can go back again and again and you can consult. There is another book which is like the similar quality, like getting it published. This is written by William Germano. This is a guide for scholars and uh, people who are they want to publish because you will get all the nuances of publishing, all the terminologies used, what why they are used, and different information in this particular book. Then there are two books. One is used as a textbook in many universities, written by Sana Lu, which is called Research Textbook of Research Ethics. As I said, this is a very uh, topic close to my heart so it, I always talk about this ethic area uh, and uh, I hope that you read this book and you understand what exactly is research ethic. And the last one uh, by Dipankar Dev, Rajiv Dey and Valentina Balas. You know, you will hear Valentina after me uh, as a keynote uh, speaker over here. This is a book uh, written by Valentina, a practical insight for researchers. This is for people who are in engineering and they want to know more about engineering research methodology. So uh, uh, it's good that you have given me time and uh, you are here to listen to me. My only suggestion to you people or uh, as like, you know, work sincerely, focus on quality, say no to academic corruption. You know, we know corruption is everywhere, but stay away from corruption so that you stay happy. Thank you very much for this opportunity. If you have any questions, I can take up. Uh, and if you don't have a question right now, you go back and use the tools, use uh, the services, and you have any queries later also, then you can reach me at onindo.bose at springernature.com. I will be happy to address them later also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an impactful oratory on research ethics and publication. I hope it will be beneficial for the whole research community. Once again, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, the today's keynote session of ICNG IoT 2022 has come to an end. It's time for the lunch break. I request everyone to join through the shared link for the parallel technical session, SAP at 3 p.m., followed by the cultural program. Once again, thank you all for your August presence. Thank you. Thank you both, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.